Bear Valley um, group, and we want to welcome you. It is great to have you with us. And we are, are in a process of studying through the Bible from we started um, Genesis 1-1, and we have, we have taken a chronological walk all the way through the Old Testament, um, through the, the life of Christ and the Gospels. Now we are in the history of the church as we study the book of Acts, and as we've gone through the book of Acts, we've stopped along the way because we realize that, oh, at this point, this is when the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the letter to the Galatians. This is where he would have written the letter to the Thessalonians. This is where he wrote the letter to Rome uh, in the book of Romans. Um, and so we've stopped chronologically to look at each of these, the, the, the parts of Scripture that we have. So it, it gives us a lot better understanding of why did Paul write the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Well, when you have just studied what he had just been through in his first missionary journey, it makes a whole lot more sense of why he was writing the things that he was writing. And so we've, we've taken that approach all the way through. So we're back now in the book of Acts. Paul is now in Jerusalem, and Paul has been, he's been detained. <clears throat> um, he's been arrested, um, but at this point, um, I don't know that arrest is necessarily the best term for it. Uh, he was rescued at the end of chapter 21. Um, uh, the apostle Paul is accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. And so the Jewish people snatch Paul, they drag him out of the temple, and they be begin to beat him. The, the point was to kill him. And, uh, and there have been a lot of rumors going on around, about Paul. Uh, and so the Jews are they're, they're out for blood. Well, the Roman captain or commander, um, he sees this going on, and he intervenes and he rescues Paul. And so that's where we find ourselves. And we, when we look at Luke, and when Luke writes this book of Acts, this letter of history, um, we notice that, that Luke, he devotes just as much time describing what's happening during the arrest and imprisonment of, of um, Paul as he did um, talking about all the missionary journeys. Um, the significance of what's going on right now uh, in Paul's arrest and what's taking place is in the history of the church. In, in, there's a lot of doctrinal things that are addressed in this as well, and it is very, very significant. Luke spends a lot of time dealing with these things. It also begins to reveal something very important, and that is the way that the Jewish people are beginning to reject God. Well, not beginning, but it, this has started a long time ago. But the, it's really becoming, coming to a head of their rejection of God and his will. And we've seen that already um, throughout this time. Just think of the people that the Jew, Jews have put to death. We've seen them kill John the Baptist. They, of course, crucified Jesus. And then after that, we see um, Stephen, who was put to death. We see the Apostle James has been put to death. And it's just a continual, they refuse to see the plan of God. And God continues to send more people to them and say, this is it. This is the plan. And that's where Paul is right now. This is the first time Paul has ever been in Jerusalem where he is actually going to preach anything to the people in Jerusalem. So Paul is now the, the, the current um, prophet, the current messenger, and they also would have killed him if it wasn't for the Roman commander coming in and intervening and, and taking him into custody. And so <clears throat> we also have to remember context of a timeline here. We are only 11 years from the year 70 A.D., um, it right now is, is 59 A.D. when Paul is in Jerusalem at this time. And so we're only 11 years away from when Rome is going to completely destroy Jerusalem. And that's God's punishment that was prophesied. We see in Matthew 24 and Luke's account as well. Um, but the, through, through, uh, because of the disobedience of the Jewish people to God, this is God's final punishment. And, but we're, we're not very far away from that. 
And so all of this is relevant. It helps us to understand the times of what are going on in and around Jerusalem while Paul is here at this time. And so <clears throat> when we get into chapter 22, I'm going to kind of just summarize a lot of this um, as we go through, but we'll read quite a bit of the text as we, we get going a little bit. Um, Paul begins here, we saw at the very end of chapter 21, as he's being marched up the staircase, you remember he was, he was, they were in the temple court, and the Romans, they have uh, Fortress Antonia, which was the Roman fortress that was built right on the, I think it's the north side, is it the north side, of the temple court, and the Jews hated that, they hated that the Romans built this massive structure right there on the temple court, right next to the temple. Um, but it, had, it, it, was, it was, uh, had walls that were 50 feet tall. It had um, two towers that went up another 50 feet, so 100 feet high. The Romans were able to watch the entire temple court, as well as most of the city of Jerusalem, from this location. So when Paul is being beaten, that's why they were able to see what was going on and come and intervene. But now they're marching Paul back up these steps up to, um, most likely, they're going back up into the, the fortress Antonio. And, and as, as they get to the top of the stairs, Paul turns to the commander and he pleads for permission to speak to the Jewish people who were just trying to kill him. And the commander grants him permission to do so. So Paul now turns to the Jewish people. And here in chapter 22, look at beginning in verse 1, it says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And so here now Paul, he, he's, he's talking to them in Hebrew. Now something interesting about that, the Roman commander probably will not understand what Paul is saying at this point. As a Roman, he probably is not fluent in Hebrew. Um, it was not very familiar. Maybe because he was in Jerusalem and, and stationed there, he'd picked up on some Hebrew. Um, but um, the Romans were not known for being, being well-versed in Hebrew. Um, so all he's going to hear is Paul speaking and the reaction of the people. That's really his, um, what he's experiencing here. But Paul turns, and when he starts speaking in Hebrew, now the Jewish people, they stop. They're like, well, what? this is our language. And they give even more attention to Paul at this time. So I'm going to summarize from verse 1 through 21. What Paul does is he gives his de defense in three parts. And I'm just going to summarize this instead of reading through it. Um, a lot of it's history that we've already seen. Paul is just recounting a lot of his history. And so the very first thing that Paul does is he starts talking about his own past. And he's trying to relate to the Jews. Remember what Paul says, his, his technique in, in trying to teach people? Um, he talks about in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 9, when he says, I'm, I'm going to become to the Jew, I'm going to become a Jew. To the Gentile, I'll become a Gentile. To one under the law, I'll become under the law. He's, he's going to try to do whatever he can to relate to the people that he's speaking to. And so that's what he's going to do here. He's trying to connect with these people. So the very first thing he does is he talks about himself being a Jew. He says, I am a Jew. He says, I, I, am, I am Hebrew. And he, I'm, I was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Um, he, he says, that's where I was born, but then I was raised in Jerusalem. Now, we see here in these two chapters that we're looking at this morning, um, Paul uh, was, was born in Tarsus, but he was raised in Jerusalem. We know that Paul has a sister, and we see that in chapter 23. Um, he has a, a sister that had to have lived in Rome because her son was connected with the Sanhedrin um, in, in Jerusalem, and, and so whether his parents moved to Jerusalem, we don't know. He could have been sent to Jerusalem to be trained and taught. Um, maybe he lived with his sister while he was there, but we do know that he has family <coughs> in Jerusalem. Um, he goes on here in this section, he says, he talks about his education. He says, I was trained by Gamaliel, which that gives Paul a ton of credibility because Gamaliel was one of the most respected teachers that the Jewish people had at that time. 
We see back in Acts chapter 5 that it's Gamaliel when Peter and John are arrested for preaching Christ. It's Gamaliel that speaks up in the Sanhedrin and gives some of his own wisdom that ultimately allows Peter and John to be, be set free. And so they respected Gamaliel. He was one of the, the, the top rabbis and teachers um, of the time. Um, Paul says, I was taught strictly according to the law of our fathers. Um, now notice he doesn't say according to the law of Moses, but the law of our fathers, um, which includes the law of Moses, but it also includes what else? All of the traditional things, all of the traditional teachings of their fathers. And so you see what Paul's doing. He's trying to connect with these, these Jews that are here. He's like, I have been where you are. I, I, I'm the same type of person that, that you are. Um, and then he mentions, he says, I was zealous. I had so much zeal for the law, just like you do today. He's trying to let them know, I, my zeal was just the same. The zeal that you had when you just tried to beat me to death is the exact same zeal that I had. And so, again, he's trying to make this connection. Then he says, and I've been in your shoes. I persecuted Christians. Uh, he uses the, the phrase, he says, I persecuted the way, and he uses that term. We, the first time we see that term is back in Acts chapter 9 when we meet Paul for the first time, or Saul for the first time, um, and he is getting permission from the Jewish leaders um, to go into other cities and to persecute the way. That was a terminology that the Jews used to refer to the church, to Christians, um, to those that followed Christ as the way. And that probably came from them hearing um, that what Jesus had said. Christians at that time um, were known for talking about being uh, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. And so it's probably where that terminology came from. Um, but <clears throat> Paul here, he's hoping that all of this that he has in common with these people, that this is going to get his foot in the door that maybe I can create enough of a relationship with these people that now I can begin to preach to them about Christ. And so that's what he does next in his defense. He now begins to tell them about his conversion. And so verses 6 through 16, he goes through this description of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He talks about Ananias, the man that was sent to him in Damascus, who preached to him. The man who, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, told him, said, why do you delay? Get up, and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so he goes through this whole account of I was just like you, but let me tell you why I've changed. You need to understand something about Jesus. There is, there is something powerful about Jesus that he's trying to get across to them here in his experience that he had on the road to Damascus. And he even then tells me, he says, I even came back to Jerusalem. And that's what verses 17 through 21 describe. I came back to Jerusalem, um, but while he was in Jerusalem... He was warned while he was in the temple praying, he describes, that Jesus came to him and warned him and basically told him you need to leave Jerusalem. And the concern was, and Paul's concern was, that my reputation of being one who had murdered Christians is going to hurt my influence in being able to teach people, the Jewish people, about Christ in Jerusalem. He knew that he had a bad reputation. And so that's when Jesus tells him, look at verse, chapter 22 and verse 21. It says, and he said to me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So Jesus tells him, that's why I've chosen you to preach to the Gentiles, not the Jews. And God had a purpose and a plan for Paul. And this was it, to send him into the Gentile country uh, to be able to, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, as soon as Paul says this, the Jews erupt again. Uh, remember what Paul was just accused of. What they were beating Paul and trying to kill him because he had, was just been accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. 
And so now, by Paul saying this, that, yeah, I'm, I work with the Gentiles. I'm preaching this message to the Gentiles. To the Jews, Paul just confirmed the accusation of, of him and Gentiles being connected. And so um, they, they go into an uproar again. And because of this, we see um, the commander take Paul in uh, and, well, let's read here, beginning in verse 22. <clears throat> Uh-huh. Here again in verse 16, we talked about this before. It is to the Colossians mm-hmm. baptism is involved, the reason are to call it just what mentioned in Acts chapter 2. Right. Starting there, and actually, of course, it starts in Joel chapter 2, where, where it was prophesied. But, of course, and that's, you know, you're going to hear that, um, the, the calling on the name of the Lord as a, a vital part of our response to our faith in Christ. But the religious world as a whole has taken that one phrase and they have applied it in ways that we don't see it being applied in Scripture. And so uh, in Acts 22, 16 is one of the most clear places that we can go to and say, okay, we know what that's connected with um, directly uh, is, is our response. Calling on the name of the Lord. It's calling on the authority of the Lord. If I'm calling on the authority of Christ, what is his authority? It's his word. It's his commands. It's what he says. Well, what are some of the commands and things of Christ? If I'm calling on Christ, I am going to submit to your name, your authority. Oh, well, Jesus is the one who said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus is, and we can go through all the commands of Christ. It's, it's all a part of obedience to his, his authority. And so, um, as well, let's look at this. Starting in verse 22. It says, they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging, so that he might, uh, he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. <clears throat> so here first thing we see is the commander takes Paul in. He realizes he, I don't believe that the commander understood anything that Paul had just said. All he sees is the response of the Jews. That they're still furious with, with Paul. And so the commander says, okay, enough of this. And he takes Paul into the fortress and he says, we're going to continue to examine him, but we're going to examine him by we're going to torture him for information. That's basically what he's saying. We're going to scourge him. We're going to take out a whip, and we're going to whip him until he gives us the information that we need of why all of this is happening. And so that's what the, uh, the plan is. Verse 25, it says, but, but when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. And the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. And the commander answered and said, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him, and the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put, put him in chains. You see, that was illegal under, under Roman law to, put, to even put a Roman in chains um, just because of an accusation. Um, we begin to see the genius of Paul. And I'm going to mention this every time. This is genius of Paul number one. Um, he's in this situation and Paul realizes, I've got an out. Um, and so he reveals his Roman citizenship. And uh, Paul knows that that's going to get him released from, from this. Um, it has to, because Roman law would not allow it. If they would have struck him one time, everybody in the room would have been put to death. Um, you could not um, punish a Roman citizen without there being a formal inquiry. Um, just because he was accused wasn't good enough. Um, that you, and, and so uh, here we have, have the, you've got to be found, found, you're innocent until proven guilty. That's, that was the principle under Roman law uh, for a Roman citizen. Now, if you weren't a Roman citizen, 
uh, then, then it didn't matter. Uh, but if you were a Roman, the Romans took care of their own. And so that's why they're all afraid right now, because if word gets out that we even put him in chains and we stretched him out, uh, then we could all be in some serious trouble. And Paul knew this. So here's the genius of Paul. He realizes, he realizes, okay, I'm not going to get, I'm going to be beaten today. Um, he's been beaten enough. He's been beaten, what, five times by whip. He's been uh, three times with rods. Um, he's been stoned multiple times. And this was one day that Paul knew that he had a way to avoid this. And it's also going to catapult him into um, the, the events that are, that are coming as well. So the commander realizes we need to put this man on trial. We can't punish a man without him being put on trial and being found guilty. And so the first trial that they put Paul up um, on is a trial uh, from the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. The commander commands the Sanhedrin to gather and then they set Paul before them. We see that there in chapter 22 and verse 30. It says, On the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And so now the trial begins. And so <clears throat> look at what Paul does, starting in chapter 23 and verse 1. Paul, looking intently at the council says, brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Uh, but, but the bystanders said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler um, of your people. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. So look what Paul does here. The first thing that Paul does, his opening statement, is one that, that, that the high priest and the Jews, they take as blasphemy. Paul is claiming that every single thing that I have ever done, I have done with a pure conscience. He's going back to when he was a Jew, well, he's still a Jew, but when he was, was persecuting Christians, he had a perfectly clear conscience. He thought he was doing the will of God. But he says, up to even this day, I still have a clear conscience. Well, that's blasphemy because now he's preaching Christ as the Messiah. And the Jews don't believe that. And so if he has a clear conscience that that's right, then that's blasphemy. So the high priest orders, uh, orders Paul to be struck. And, uh, and so what Paul does is he appeals to the law of Moses. Um, uh, Ananias, the high priest, um, is described by many as, as one of the worst high priests that ever existed. There were some bad ones. You go back into, especially the time between the, the Old Testament and New Testament, that intertestamental period, there were some pretty bad high priests. Um, you go into the Old Testament, there were some pretty bad high priests. But Ananias is described by historians, Jewish historians, as being one of the worst. Um, and uh, as a, uh, Paul responds to what happens here by appealing to the law. The law of Moses um, protected people who were accused. Uh, it, it didn't allow them to be punished until they were proven guilty. Um, kind of similar to the Roman law, but that was God's law, the law of Moses. That's what Paul, you strike me, you're accusing me of breaking the law, and then you break the law? Uh, in, in effect, you're doing the same thing. And they immediately jump on Paul and say, you're going to talk to the high priest like that? Probably because this was something that the commander ordered to happen immediately and quickly, the high priest is not in his formal garb. Paul didn't recognize him as the high priest at, uh, uh, while he was there. And so um, Paul um, immediately responds with an apology. Apology. 
he apologizes, very sincerely apologizes. Matter of fact, he quotes Exodus 22 and verse 28 as part of this apology of, of I know that I am not to speak evil of a ruler of, of God's people. Even though he was a vile, evil high priest, the Apostle Paul still knew I am bound by God to respect those who are in authority over me. We've already looked at all of these letters where Paul spent, like Romans chapter 13, when Paul wrote to the church in Rome about respecting uh, and honoring those that are in authority over you. And here, Paul is walking the walk. He's not just talking the talk. Here is someone that, if there's anyone that he has the right to say, I, there is, because of the type of person you are, I don't have to respect you at all because you're not anything of what God wants you to be. Paul could have said that, but he doesn't because he understands God's law. God's law is those who are in authority over us are there because God put them there. And whether I like them or not, whether they are doing right or not, that is still God's law. And so Paul apologizes. He realizes he was wrong. Um, he had done wrong by, by making a, a statement like that against the high priest, no matter what type of a person he was. But then we see the genius of Paul show up again. Paul looks around the room, and he notices, I've got Sadducees on one side, I've got Pharisees on one side, and he knows how much they hate each other, because he is a Pharisee. And so he simply opens this up by, by pitting the two against each other, divide and conquer. Paul knew I can cause chaos right here, right now. So all he does is he says, the reason that I'm here, this is why the commander called this, this trial, was to find out what you're accused of. Why are you here? And Paul says, I'm here because I'm a Pharisee, because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now he's talking about the resurrection of Christ. But the Sadducees didn't believe in any kind of resurrection. They didn't believe in any kind of afterlife. They didn't believe in any kind of, of spiritual angels or anything like that in a spiritual realm. The Pharisees did. And so uh, uh, what, what, one of the most interesting things that happens here, drop down to verse 9. It says, And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began uh, to argue heartily, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Um, suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. Paul has even got the Pharisees to start defending him now. And so Paul is a genius in what he's doing. Well, this argument and this uproar, everything that happens here, is, it, it becomes so great that the commander decides, he's like, ah, nothing is going to get accomplished here. And so he grabs Paul again, and he yanks Paul back out, and... Uh, and because of the fight that starts between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, one of the most significant things, I think, at, toward, at the end of Paul's life is what happens in verse 11. In verse 11 it says, But on, that, on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. All of a sudden, Paul now knows, I'm going to Rome. The Lord, this would be the Lord Jesus, has appeared to, to Moses, or to, to uh, that, that would be a, a different time. He appeared to, to uh, Paul and says, says, you have done what I've asked you to do in Jerusalem, and I'm going to have you do the same thing in Rome. So from this point on, Paul doesn't need to be afraid of anything. He knows that he is going to be in Rome one day. The commentator in Bruce's commentary, he writes this. I love the way he describes this. He says, this assurance meant uh, much to Paul during the delays and anxieties of the next two years and goes far to account for the calm and dignified bearing which from now on marks him out as a master of events rather than their victim. His plan to see Rome, he now knows, is certain of fulfillment, and with that, he is content. Paul has nothing to fear 
He knows that eventually he's going to be in Rome. He knows he's not going to be killed here in Jerusalem. He knows he's not going to die anywhere along the way. And so whether it's beatings or it's shipwrecks or whatever he's about to encounter, he knows nothing's going to happen because God already told me that I'm going to be in Rome. And so we see that confidence now appear in Paul that, that uh, he knows uh, at least a portion of what's going to take place for, through the rest of his life. Now, just to kind of summarize what happens now, there are, there are 40 men who approach the Sanhedrin. They say, we're going to assassinate Paul. And this is uh, verses 12 through 35. They approach the Sanhedrin and say, you go tell the commander that you want to question Paul again, and while they're bringing him out, we're going to ambush him, and we're going to kill him. As a matter of fact, they say, we're not even going to eat or drink anything until he is dead. I wonder if they held up to that when they failed on their plot to kill, kill him. I, I doubt it. Uh, but, but here uh, Paul is, uh, or the, these men are trying to do this. Well, it's in verse 16. Look at chapter 23 and verse 16. It says, But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. So, this, these, this is the only time, uh, the only relatives that were ever told in Scripture um, of Paul's. Um, and so we know he had a sister who had a son. And so his nephew is there amongst the Jewish council. He's connected with them somehow because he hears this plot. And when he does, he goes and tells Paul. Paul then sends him to go tell the commander. He says, you need to go tell the commander. But at the same time, Paul knows, I have nothing to worry about because I'm going to Rome. I know they're not going to kill me. And it's a, the confidence that Paul has now is, is something that, that uh, he has never had before. And so um, the, the commander here in chapter 23 then, he makes a decision. He says, There's, a Roman citizen is not going to be killed on my watch. And so he immediately takes action, and, uh, and he is going to send Paul to Caesarea. Caesarea is where the governor is. This is the governor Felix, and uh, and 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 so while Paul is there, um, um, he, he's he's getting ready to be sent. Now, there's a letter. I'm going to skip through a lot of this because it's a lot of historical information that I love that isn't real pertinent to our lesson. Um, but there's a lot of things that we learn about the commander and about Felix just from this letter here. Um, it is believed because of the word that Luke uses in verse 25. When he says, and he wrote a letter having this form. That word form, tupos, um, is a word that gives us the indication that the letter that we see here from verse 26 through 30 is, is an um, exact copy of the letter that was sent. It was the exact words. And so that's, that's an interesting thing to, to note. Um, but Felix... Um, Felix, as a governor, he was a freed slave, and nobody really understood how he rose to the power of influence that he did. Um, nobody liked him. He was a horrible leader. Um, and, uh, but, and there, Tacitus, the Roman historian, he even says, he is a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the power of king with the spirit of a slave. Um, and so um, he's not a well-liked person. He was a horrible leader. 400 soldiers bring Paul to, Ces or, well, halfway to um, Antipatrice. Um, it's about halfway there. Um, and then from there, um, uh, 70 horsemen then continue the trip with Paul to Caesarea. The rest of the soldiers go back to Jerusalem. And so Felix, again, he was not equipped for all of this. Matter of fact, it's only a couple of months after Paul is there that Felix is going to be removed as governor. And so here's the big picture of Paul's trip. The red dotted line is going to be his trip from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. And so far, down in the bottom right corner, that's all we've seen so far. Paul's gone from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and he's going to spend about two years in Caesarea. He's going to be there for a while. Um, but again, the whole time that, that he's there, he has nothing to fear. He's able to speak as boldly as he wants because he knows he's going to Rome. And so do we not have that confidence? 
as Christians, I know I'm going to heaven. I know it. John tells me that. In John chapter 5, he tells me that I'd write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. I know that. We should be able to stand and speak boldly about our faith because we know where we're going. We know that our citizenship lies in heaven, not here. And so we can, we can take that same confidence that Paul has and say, it doesn't matter what happens on this earth. I know where I'm going to end up. And so we, we, we live our lives in faith because of that. And so we'll pick up here. Paul is in Caesarea. We'll pick up uh, there on Wednesday night, chapter 24.